It's uh, good to be with you again this morning and uh, share the Word of God with you. I pray that uh, you have a peaceful New Year's celebration and we're able to get a few minutes sleep. <laughs> anyway, it's a joy to share with you from the Word of God today. Let's open our service today in prayer. Father, we thank you today that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that your ways are wonderful and marvelous. And that when we discover them and walk in them, we are blessed and filled with life and goodness. Lord, we have untold blessings that have come to us as a result of walking in your ways. We pray, Father, today as we look into your word that you will speak into each of our hearts and lives. Speak into my heart and life. And everyone who listens today, you might be honored and glorified and your great mission in the earth will be accomplished. Thank you for being our helper now as we get into God's word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I was uh, driving down the high road in Wheelstone uh, the other day and happened to drive by uh, the old sheep shed that we had for about 25 years, <clears throat> 30 years. And all that remains uh, is just some ruins, <laughs> to put it bluntly. And it, it is a, a reminder of uh, an, a lot of uh, years of blessing and increase and salvation and healing and miracles and everything uh, that God did in that season. But now uh, there's just a giant hole there and a few uh, remains or ruins uh, while they uh, decide on when and how they're going to make some new construction. And I felt quickened by the Lord to uh, bring to you where I believe we are at this point, at the start of this new year. And I uh, felt directed to go to the book of Nehemiah because then the book of Nehemiah is a wonderful, exciting book as it is a great story that God has provided for us. The Bible says uh, all these things are written for our learning upon whom the ends of the age are come. So it's not just a story, but it's a story with a message, uh, a timeless message. And I thought how uh, relevant it is to where we are as a congregation where our world is, and so I want to look at that today as we look into this story of Nehemiah. I'd encourage you to read through the book of Nehemiah half a dozen times over the next month and allow the Holy Spirit to uh, bring into your heart uh, insights and understandings about uh, how we go forward. And I've entitled my message today, uh, The Great Challenge That Is Before Us. Uh, I have... Uh, a picture of uh, what the scenario was like in Nehemiah's day as he found himself uh, as a government employee and yet he was heavy hearted because the central city of Israel's or Judah's uh, worship was looking like this. Uh, and it was in ruins. The temple had been, uh, for the most part, constructed. It was not a place that you would uh, say, yeah, let's, <laughs> at least in terms of uh, anything in this sit situation where every their faith in Christ uh, had almost gone away entirely. And the people were still there who had remained during the time of captivity, uh, but thousands had been scattered to other countries and, and forced to live in places that were not where they were born. And so uh, he found himself greatly burdened as a government employee, as a, a, uh, the cupbearer to the king, about uh, his own people and the lack of spiritual vitality and 
So he received a report uh, about Jerusalem and what was going on there. And basically they said uh, what was going on in Jerusalem looked like this. This is what the city looked like. Uh, okay, uh, perhaps a, a model. Uh, it certainly has a great parallel to our time because if you looked at uh, our world right now, our world places actually looks just like this picture. And unfortunately, in many places, the church is like this. It's not a place of vitality and blessing and magnetic attractiveness that would invite those who are living in such a place to say, yeah, we'd like to go there. We'd like to live there. And so I thought, what an appropriate book to examine as, as God nudged my heart in relation to uh, where our own sheep shed was. And of course, it's, it's not the bricks and mortar that is so important, but it is people's lives. And the story is uh, only illustrating how significant the devastation and that has taken place in the lives of Israel and Judah, as well as in our world today. You know, uh, one of the things that man has been prone to since the garden is what the Bible calls drift. And in one respect, probably because righteousness and evil are next door neighbors, uh, there is always that beckoning call of evil to cause men and women to move away from the life and the blessing and the vitality of their Christian faith. It's not a logical thing. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of deception, as you know, that started in the garden. It started with deception. And so Israel found themselves in a place where they had served the Lord. They had been prospered and blessed and Amazing in every way that you can imagine. Their health was good, their finance were good. And then as God prophesied in Deuteronomy, they turned away from him. They didn't need God any longer. And when they begin to creep away and drift away from righteousness and vitality in their relationship with Jehovah God, they drifted into idolatry. And so God brought them into this... Uh, or they brought themselves into this cycle of decline, discipline, repentance, and restoration. And if you study uh, redemptive history from Genesis to the present, you can see this cycle is something that has taken place since the beginning of time, and it's only the last generation that knocks this particular cycle in the head, the cycle of decline, discipline, repentance, and restoration. And, you know, as you look at our world, you can see that uh, so many things are in ruin. The economies, uh, trust in, in authority and government and health. And you know, there's, the whole world is a picture of, of the ruins that you were just looking at a, a moment ago. And so this book of Nehemiah, I think, is, is so uh, poignantly poised to tell us some powerful truths as to where God wants to take us individually, as families, as businesses, as a church in 2022. And uh, so I want to look at this, this great uh, challenge. As I said, the, the walls of Jerusalem were in ruins. Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 3 says he got the report. And he said, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem, the wall around the city, is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. There is no comfort, there is no security uh, to be had in living in that city. And so this was uh, distressing him a great deal. And the people themselves had adopted uh, a level of mixture and compromise that had brought corruption to their lives as they moved away from the, the truth and the law that God had given them to, 
keep them on track and keep them walking in his ways. And they could hardly be distinguished from the Babylonians, from their captors. They had adopted some, so many of their customs and they had gotten to the place where they looked to government to, to be their salvation. Uh, and if the government wasn't uh, supplying it, then of course they were stuck. And you, you can see that so readily in our world today is that men and women look to government and, and they're angry with government if they think the government just isn't doing what it should do to provide salvation for them. Salvation meaning finance and health and opportunity and so on and so forth. And so the government has become the savior of our time. And of course, because governments fail and they're destined to fail, they uh, have produced an awful lot of anger and fear and discouragement. And that was kind of something that had enveloped God's people in Nehemiah's day as well. They adopted that same sense of despair and futility because the government wasn't uh, making their lives any better. And the language that was spoken uh, had changed. God's people now living amongst uh, those that did not have Jehovah as their God, and now were forced to adopt and had adopted the language of the people that they lived among. In fact, uh, in uh, Nehemiah 13 and verse 23, the Bible says, half of the children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples. Those were heathen tribes and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. They did not know how to speak the, in other words, Hebrew that they had communicated with had gone away and they had adopted the language of their culture and of their time. And you can see the parallel here is that you find yourself in serious trouble if you don't speak the language that is acceptable in our time. Uh, we, we know people who have lost their job or their job was threatened uh, not because they did anything wrong, but because they, they didn't use the right word or words. And, and so uh, the world is, is trying to reshape our lives and everybody's life according to the culture of this world, which is governed by the devil. It's based on the values and the morals of this world. And so if you're going to live in this world, you're either going to speak their language or you're going to speak the language of a Christian. And, and of course, there's that, that conflict. And so they'd gotten so far where the, the, a good portion of the, the second and third generation, they didn't even know that the Hebrew language. They had adopted the language of the peoples who lived around them. And there is that pressure today. You can, so you can see readily that parallel between Nehemiah's day and our day. Debt and poverty were rampant, as you can imagine. Uh, all the wars, the scattering, uh, the being a refugee, trying to eke out a living. Uh, and so that had brought a lot of discouragement and despair and a sense of futility to God's people. They really were surviving uh, almost in Nehemiah's day. Uh, their, their faith was very low, and you might say a blanket of discouragement was over their heads as they walked through their daily lives. Uh, even though the temple was still there in Jerusalem, uh, any sort of involvement was more religious activity without any sort of real vitality in, in worship. Conspiracy theories abound in Nehemiah's day. Let me just give you an example. In Nehemiah chapter 6, and beginning with verse 5 says, In the fifth time, well, this is while they were trying to restore and rebuild, uh, Sanballat sent his aid to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, It is reported among the nations. Aha! How relevant does that sound? We would call that the internet now. It is reported amongst the nations, and... Google, I mean, Geshem says it is true that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt and therefore you're building the wall 
And according to these reports, you are about to become their king. What, what is his response? He says, as you're about to become their king and have appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. I mean, this is so relevant. All the conspiracy theories and the prophetic voices involved going every imaginable direction. And, and you can see that's relevant in our time. You can find a million prophets uh, on the internet and they're all saying different things. They all got different ideas of what tomorrow's gonna be like and next year and who's got this going on and that going on. And, and so there's this mixture of conspiracy theories and prophetic voices. There isn't any unity. And so uh, what you're going to take in is not going, going to give you clear, firm, Bible-based direction for what you're going to face, but confusion, misunderstanding. And that was the way it was in his day. It says, appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let us confer together. I sent him to this reply. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you're saying is happening. You know, there's a thousand new conspiracy theories traipsing around the internet every day. He says, this was Nehemiah's reply. He said, I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You're just making it up out of your head. And he goes on, to, he kind of pulls back so he can give a little perspective. He says, they're all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. This is Nehemiah talking. And you can see the conspiracy theories, even if you, uh, you know, buy into one, what's it producing inside of you? Moral outrage? Anger? Does it bring you peace? No, the Bible makes it clear. The conspiracies and the prophetic voices that are not based in the Holy Spirit and the Word of God will produce the wrong things in the lives of God's people. And sadly, today in our time, that is taking place. And so people are not filled with hope and faith and a sense of divine energy that is pushing them forward to complete their particular personal life mission and calling that God has given them and to work in the context of their own local church. But so many people are buying into this and living in the cave of despair and discouragement. And so in Nehemiah's day, they had the same thing. They didn't have the internet like we do, of course. Uh, but those same types of things took place with the same mission and cause and motivation behind them. Satan will use anything that looks good, and you have to be wise and say, okay, what is this producing in me? What's this producing me in me? Is it drawing me closer to the Lord? Is it strengthening my faith? Or is it taking me off some cliff of, into confusion and despair? If it's not producing that kind of fruit, you need to look at the root and see what's... Yeah, there are prophetic voices. I understand that. I accept that. But it's so important that you judge every voice that you hear, including mine, by this book. By this book. And the Bible says that Paul said it himself. He says, if I or anybody else preaches you something that's not consistent with this book, let him be accursed. And so that's so important in our time. And that was one of the things that had also happened in Nehemiah's day. The, the law, which was basically their Bible, had gone missing. People didn't have a consciousness, even a knowledge of the Scriptures because they weren't taught any longer. They weren't taught in the family. They weren't taught in the synagogue, the temple. Nowhere was the Word of God being taught. And so there had to come some restoration. And it's so important for us to uh, 
capture this message today. As God has placed us at the start of this year to plow in to the days that are ahead with a sense of our own mission and calling in the Lord, not afraid of any of the hardships that are currently on the earth or ones that uh, the news prophets would have you believe are coming on the earth, but with faith and with courage. And we will, like Nehemiah, accomplish the rebuilding of God's house and the place and the mission and the calling that we have as a congregation to reach our community and our region and our world for Christ. And so I want to kind of look at rebuilding because I, I like that picture better. <laughs> uh, we, we should have a, a and I, I've got a picture. Uh, we, we move from the ruins to this picture that I have for you where there's a place that's got freedom and, and walls and security and commerce. And, 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 and you can see even in this simple little picture here, there's uh, some beauty and attractiveness to it. And, and God's city, God's people are, are meant to be like this. His people, not just where they live. And so just as God had assigned Nehemiah to rebuild and to restore so that Israel and Judah could be that powerful voice and impact in their day for who Jehovah really is, so has he also assigned that responsibility to us. And I want to just look at a couple of verses of Scripture here. First John chapter 5 and verse 19 to 21. You know, I, I think that it's important to understand this simple principle. And I'd like you to read along these verses here today so that you can have real clarity in grasping what it is you see on your television and on your iPad and or your tablet and your phone when you get all this information. First John 5.19 says, First of all, we know that we are the children of this world. No, we are the children of God. We're God's family. That's who we are. That's who we are. And that the whole world... Listen to this, is under the control of the evil one. The whole world. Somebody said, but pastor, I thought God is in control. Yeah, God is in control. But the Bible says the whole world or the whole worldly system is under the control of the evil one. And until that control is wrested from him, those that are being controlled are under the evil one. And I think sometimes people have the idea that we're going to take this world and make it, you know, beautiful and Christian. Not as long as it is the world as we know it. You were once in the world, and according to Ephesians 2, you were under the control of the evil one, even if you didn't realize it. And God took you out of this world and he put you into the kingdom of God. So you would be under his control. His control. And so unless and until this world comes under God's control, it will be under the control of the evil one. There's only two controllers. <laughs> Yes, God ultimately controls the devil and he limits his activity and so on. But he's ultimately in control of everything. But in terms of this world and its system, the Bible tells us that it is under the control of the evil one. Now, if this world, listen to me carefully now, is under the control of the evil one, what do you think the evil one would be doing? He would be creating more evil. He would be governing people's lives so they were 
destroyed, they were killed, they were sucked into deception and evil and corruption. And, 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 and so when you see a government not acting in a compassionate, kind, caring, unselfish way, don't be shocked. Don't be shocked. Don't put your hope in the government. Put your hope in God. In fact, that's probably one of the great lessons of our time is that, you know, we have all this money and all this knowledge and we go into space, et cetera, et cetera. But this little tiny invisible thing called COVID can shut everything down across the world. Across the world. And so if you don't put your trust in God, then your life is going to be swept around by everything that's going on in our world, whether it has to do with health or finance or family or morality or language, you name it. Put your hope in God. He says, we know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And he, he finishes with this little interesting statement. He says, my little children, keep yourself from idols. Idols. We know who we are. We are his children. And we've been given understanding so we might know him who is true. But he says, keep yourself from, in other words, don't allow yourself to drift by giving attention, undue attention, undue attention to things that are outside the boundaries that are to do with this world. That's how idolatry took place. Idolatry took place largely because of eyes, you know. Israel said, you know, we've been, we've been checking it out. And other people, they got kings. God said, no, you don't want a king. Yeah, 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 we want to be like the other nations. Okay, fine. I'll tell you what will happen to you if you have a king. If you have an earthly king, he'll take your sons and daughters and tax you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, but we want to be like everybody else. And so he gave him a king. He gave him Saul. And that's exactly what happened with Saul. And that story is repeated so many times in our, and you can see it around the world, is that the populations of this world are looking to somewhere for a savior. And I want to tell you, we found the savior. And the savior wants to come as a great savior back into Wheelstone and to London and to the UK and to this world in an awesome way. And he's assigned us a responsibility to rebuild where there has been ruins that we might be just that. And so you read the book of Nehemiah. And so Nehemiah gives it uh, himself to this process and miracles took place. Amazing miracles take place. And they take place because God had assigned him this calling. God's given us a calling as New Life Bible Church to be rebuilders and restorers. And he will do all kinds of miracles to bring that to pass. Because as one man, Nehemiah didn't have a chance, but because he plugged into, he repented, and he humbled himself for himself and for the nation, and he got into fasting and prayer and humbling himself and asking God's forgiveness and calling others to do the same, God's grace came upon them in a great way. And as a result, the walls were rebuilt and the city was restored. Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 15 says, So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. Now, uh, even by building standards in there, that was miraculous. There was a grace that came upon them. Worship was restored. And I, I you know, you read the book, you, you're going to get all, a lot more detail than I have time to, to go into this morning. But worship was restored amongst God's people. Nehemiah chapter 3, 9 and verse 3 says, When all our enemies, they stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God to a, for a quarter of the day. So you can see the word of God's being restored to its place of centrality in the lives of God's people. And that he spent another quarter of the day in confession 
and another in confession and in worshiping the Lord. Many other verses in, in this great story of how worship and the singers and the musicians and so on all begin to come out of the woodwork and begin to give themselves and their abilities to bring great praise and honor and worship to the Jehovah who was restoring them, who was their salvation. And so with the strategy that God had given Nehemiah, all these things begin to take place like dominoes. As I said, the Word of God returned to its central place. Uh, the Gospel was preached, Nehemiah 8 and verse 15. I thought this was so exciting. They're, they're trying to, to you know, become who they are now. And, and so they're, they're doing this and they're rebuilding the city and people are worshiping and they're reading the Word of God and they're repenting and walking in humility. And in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 15, the Bible says, and they should proclaim this word, they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. So the good news was going out, was going out again. People weren't just kind of hunkered down in discouragement and despair. They were saying, hey, you know, God is with us. We, we, we have turned back to Him. We've set aside uh, looking to government and all those things that the world looks to for value and, and affirmation and enjoyment. We, we set those things aside. You know, the central place of our joy and life is Jesus. It's Him. It's Jehovah. And wherever He lives, it's a place of joy. And they begin to rehearse all of the covenant promises that God had given them in Nehemiah chapter 9. Financial giving was restored. Uh, people begin to, instead of just living in survival mode, they begin to take portions uh, that they had and, and send them out to other parts of the country and to people who were struggling far worse than they were. Generosity was revived amongst God's people. You can see this kind of thing was, is so clearly pictured in Acts chapter 3 when revival came upon God's people there in the first century their hearts were so turned that they cared for each other more than they cared for themselves. The Sabbath law or principle of rest and faith in God was restored in Nehemiah 13 and verse 19, and I won't take time to read that. But as they put their trust in God, they could sow and believe that there was going to be enough for the Sabbath year's harvest to take care of them when they weren't planting. And they put their trust or their financial life in God. And as we come to the end here, I want to give you what I believe are some very important principles of our modern strategy that parallels what we have found in the book of Nehemiah. Because as they took on these things, God helped them. And created, I think, some of the most exciting days in Old Testament history. As the temple was restored, the city was restored, the people were restored, families were restored. And the message of the gospel went out to the world. Number one, I believe that as it says in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 20, as God put this into the heart of Nehemiah, Nehemiah, in the midst of all the discouragement, he says in chapter 2 and verse 20, in, in the face of all that's going on, all the ruins, he says, the God of heaven will give us success. We will, as his servants, start rebuilding. You know, we lost our sheep shed, our building. <laughs> but we've been building another one. And I believe that though a sheep shed is just a sheep shed, it's all part 
of what God is about to do for us in 2022. And so you need to receive this word today in your own personal life, in your family, in your marriage, in your business. And for us as a congregational family, the God of heaven will give us success. The government's not going to give us another building. They're not going to knock on your door and say, oh, you know, we've neglected you, so we have 50,000 pounds we're going to put into your account. The government's not going to come along and say, oh, yes, we, we are, we're going to heal your body, and we're going to draw all of your family back to Christ. We're going to spread the gospel in the community. No, no, that's our task. That's our task. And so Nehemiah makes plain that as... God's people would seek the Lord. God would work with them and restore. So that's what we're going to do in 2022. More than ever is seek the Lord. And we'll start in the month of January and from the 10th through the 15th with a time of prayer and fasting and seeking the Lord. And I want to encourage you to embrace that period of time, not just another time to seek the Lord, but for you to accept how God might be calling you to rebuild and restore the ruins. Maybe in your own life, your family, in the community, wherever it is where things are not what they should be. And I'll be giving you specific details about that time of fasting and prayer. I'd also like to encourage you that even as it was in Nehemiah's day, as people reached out and they connected with one another. And, you know, when hardships come, people do one of two things. They either burrow into some hole, become isolated, become crazy in the head, and disappear. Or they say, you know, i got to find somebody else and, and get with them and encourage them and be encouraged by them. I want to encourage you to stay connected to the family of God. That's where God lives, according to Psalm 132, Hebrews 3, 6. That's where God lives. You will not survive on your own. You will survive in vital company with others. Stay connected in relationships. Reach out. Even if you have to stay in for some reason, you can reach out with social media and say, you know, I was praying for you and God gave me this verse and I just want to share this word from the word of God with you and pray with you and encourage you. How are you? How's your family? How are your kids? How are your finances? How's your health? Stay connected. Don't live in isolation. The Bible says God sees one of his kids in isolation and says, I'm going to put him in a family. And God would put you in a family and he would expect you and I to act like we were in a family when we are in a family. Number three, reach out with new initiatives to reach the lost. The word was trumpeted across the surrounding regions in Nehemiah's day. It went out. And God wants to give us in 2022 some new initiatives for reaching those who do not know him, who are living in the ruins every day. We'll be sharing with you more on that subject. Continue in faith for our own sheep shed. Yeah, we, we just need kind of a logistical base. And I, I believe God will give us that base. I believe his word has made that so apparent to us. Establish our families in greater strength. You know, if there's anything that Satan wants to do in our time is he wants to destroy people's lives by destroying their families. Because the family is the manufacturing plan of society. If we have all kinds of teenagers today who are running around stabbing and killing each other, record numbers in London, why? They come out of the family. They come out of the family. And God wants to cause us to have godly, strong families so that those who grow up in our homes grow up to become strong, amazing God-filled, miracle-producing men and women of God. God also wants to enlarge our giving and our sowing. 
You know, when you read through the book of Nehemiah, they had such joy that came to them. And there was such increase that came to God's people as they opened their hearts and gave out. God wants to enlarge our giving, our sowing. And lastly, I believe God wants us to cut back on our non-essential web life. Non-essential web life. You see, you're either going to get the Bible out of the Bible or some digital form of the Bible, or you're going to go with the other Bible. The web. What's on the web? So many people are eating junk food that is poisonous. But I read an article, really interesting article, about where we're headed. You know, many years ago, and I'll close with this story, uh, I happened to be able to read a, a journal that was published by uh, Dun and Bradstreet, which were a credit rating uh, organization for very, very large companies. And so they, they would do a credit rating on some company if they were going to do a stock merger or sale or apply for something. And uh, in, in this particular uh, journal, they were talking about all the breakthrough uh, changes that were coming in the world because of computers and so on. And I read something in there that so staggered me. I said, yeah, no, this is really just science fiction. I mean, he just, uh, they said, you know, there's coming a day when, uh, and this was uh, almost 50 years ago, there's coming a day when they will put a chip in your brain, and that chip, how, though it will be extremely small, will have as much information on it as is in all of the libraries around the world. And you will have access to that information in your own brain. And, you know, I, I was really into books and I'd been to quite a few libraries and big libraries and I just couldn't imagine having all that knowledge in my head. <laughs> I didn't stop to think when the Bible says, if you had all that knowledge, as knowledge puffs up, everybody would have to buy a larger size hat. But I thought this was really incredulous. But we've come a long ways on that journey. And so I want to read you about something that I know some of you would be aware of, and it's called Metaverse. It says, imagine walking down the street and suddenly you think of a product you need. Immediately next to you, a vending machine appears filled with that product and the variations you were thinking of. You stop, pick an item from the vending machine, it's shipped to your house, and then you continue on your way. Next, imagine a husband and wife. The husband offers to go to the store, but the wife can't remember the name and the type of the product that she needs. Her brain computer interface device recognizes it for her and transmits a link to her husband's device along with what stores and what aisles it's located. Welcome to the metaverse. Alternate digital realities where people work, play, and socialize. As you can call it, metaverse, mirror world, AR cloud, magic verse, Live maps, spatial internet. Says, but one thing for certain is coming, and it's a big deal. Wikipedia defines metaverse as collective virtual shared space created by the convergence of virtually enhanced physical reality and physically persistent virtual space. Now, let me just break it down very simply. In our day, Right now, you have a problem with your heart. Doctors can put a computer in your chest. And that computer in your chest gets signals, pulses from your heart. And they go to that computer. It's in your chest. And that computer that's in your chest 
transmits a signal that Wi-Fi picks up and sends it to the doctor so he can know automatically what's going on in your heart at that moment. I don't have time to fully open up this subject. But the world of the evil imagination will be tapped in an incredible way so that what you think can be transmitted and what others think can be transmitted to you. So decisions need to be taken at various points of our journey as to what sort of access we are going to allow. You say, oh, pastor, you, you just don't like technology. No, that's not true. That's not true. Where technology has helped me, I am grateful. But I also know it also is, can be a, a huge, huge stumbling block in our time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you had called us to walk with you in, in an amazing way and to bring restoration and beauty to a world that is just full of ruins. People's lives are, have been devastated by the pandemic and by sin and evil and murder and all kinds of terrible, terrible things. And you called us to partner with you in this great mission Take the message of hope, Lord, to take the message of health and healing, and miracles, kindness and goodness, generosity to a people who know nothing of it, but whose lives have been ravaged for the lack of it. Lord, we say yes. And we want to take the message of Nehemiah and to seek you and to hear from you and obey you so that we can see that kind of rebuilding and restoration take place. And while we're praying this morning, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, but you would like Him to come into your life and be for you a great Savior and do in you and for you what you could never do for yourself. And you are ready to believe that you are a sinner and that Christ died for sinners. You're ready to choose Him today and give up yourself that you might have Him. Pray this simple prayer with me today. Jesus, I come to You today. I acknowledge and readily admit I am a sinner. I believe you died on Calvary's cross for the sins of all mankind. And my sins were included. I ask you now to forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me, wash me, and come and live inside of me. I ask you today to be my Savior and my Lord. I give you the reins of my life. Thank you for the promise of your word that if I would confess, you would forgive and live inside of me. I receive you now and thank you for what you did and what you have done today. Father, we pray that the outpouring of the Spirit in each of our lives will cause us to come into divine coalition with you. That the same calling and mission that you had when we came to this country and we started what became New Life Bible Church will be advanced again and again and again because we seek you and we obey you. Thank you for being our helper. Thank you for being our father. Thank you for being our great savior. 
in Jesus' most precious and powerful name. Amen. God bless you.